let's go ahead and kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much this morning that we can flee to Christ and we can find deliverance. Thank you so much that in amazing ways you can open the prison cells and set us free. Thank you for your goodness to us. We pray for the Holy Spirit to join us today to strengthen us, to humble us, to help us to ever focus on the power of Christ, to live His life. In His name we pray. Amen. Well, I must say it was a, a great blessing for me to uh, sit in Sabbath school this morning. I really enjoyed that. And um, I have enjoyed uh, working with the young people, with Miss P and others that have come through over the years. But um, it was a real treat for me this morning. And it was a great blessing. A great blessing. Really appreciated it. You know, I'd like to take a look at a few Bible promises as we get started today. They're both in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. The Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. These were the words that Jesus quoted when he went back home to Nazareth. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. To give unto them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they might be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. You know, I don't know why somebody would want to kill Christ for then saying, this day are these words fulfilled in your ears. I find those verses to be full of such hope and strength. Notice it says that Christ came to bind up those who are broken hearted. To set at liberty the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound. I don't know about you, but I know with me that sometimes locked into this body that I have, I feel like I'm in prison. Because this body wants to do things that I don't want it to do. And so I feel like I'm a captive. And I am so thankful today. <laughs> I am so thankful today that Christ came to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those that are bound. You know, it's interesting that various Bible writers, Isaiah does it a few times in Isaiah chapter 42, he refers again 
to those who are in prison. In Isaiah 42, verses 6 and 7. The Bible says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. Now this is a prophecy about Christ. It says, I have called thee in righteousness, will hold thine hand, will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. Now a lot of those things there we can claim for our own. Number one, that Christ has called each of us to righteousness, to following his law. And he has promised us that he will hold our hand. You know, this week I was talking with an elderly lady in um, the Midwest. And before, as we were talking, she had ordered some books for one of her children. And before we got off the phone, she said, um, she said, Brother Bill, will you do something for me before we get off the phone? I said, um, what's that? She said, will you pray for me? And I know that probably within the last year, she had lost her husband. And uh, her one child lives there on the property where she is. But then she has other children in other parts of the country. But how wonderful it was to be able to pray and and claim this promise in Isaiah 42 where God says I will hold your hand so no matter where we are no matter how forsaken or lonely or whatever it is that we may feel and we may feel separated from family friends Christ has said I will hold your hand now that's a wonderful promise. It's a wonderful promise, folks. Verse 7, it says, To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Now too often, I'll never forget when I was in Red Bluff, I was giving a Sabbath school class one time and a gentleman who was extremely well-to-do, I can still remember his name, it was, well, he's passed on, so I think I'm safe to say it. His name was Howard Durbin. And Howard had paved the, the uh, parking lot at, our church, at the church there and had done a, a lot of repairs and had foot the bill, and just all kinds of things. He was very generous. Well, one Sabbath, we were talking in Revelation 14 about Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And... Uh, we went into Revelation 14 prior to that where it talked about the 144,000 and it said, um, let's see, they are not defiled by women for they are virgins. And I, and I looked at the class and I said, now what does that mean? Well, Howard was very generous. But Howard was not somebody you'd call a theologian. You understand. And so he just blurts out real loud, which was kind of unfortunate uh, because he was wrong. But anyway, that's okay. That's what Sabbath school is all about. It's for learning, right? That, that's what we're here for is to learn because none of us have reached the pinnacle yet. And Howard yells out and he says, that's talking about people who have never been in, in a relationship with something. And I'm going, whoopsie daisy, I think we need to do a little educating here. Well, folk, Isaiah 42 and verse 7, it's not talking about people that have 
had a brush with the law and are in a prison cell somewhere. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about people who are imprisoned in a, in a human body that wants to do things and they're, they're captive by it. They're, they're held by it. That's what it's talking about. And it says that Christ came to deliver the prisoners from the prison and them that are in darkness out of the prison house to open the blind eyes. It's not talking about people who are physically blind. It's talking about people who recognize they are spiritually blind and they need spiritual discernment. And so Christ came to free us from the prison in which we find ourselves today. I'm thankful. Thankful that Christ can still do that and is willing to do that for each one of us. This morning, Ezekiel part 24, this is the second to last meeting in Ezekiel. It's the flowing river. In uh, three weeks, we will look at the final part to Ezekiel, the dividing up of the promised land. But uh, for today, Ezekiel part 24, the flowing river. Next slide, sweetie. Ezekiel 47, uh, the first part of it, it's amazing. Uh, it's very simple. It's very simple. But it's profound in what, it's commu what it communicates. And that's what we're going to study today. Ezekiel 47, verses 1 and 2. The Bible, and notice I underlined one part because it's repeated throughout the book of Ezekiel, or the chapter 47. It says, afterward he brought me again to the door of the house. Now what house was that? The temple. That's right, Reggie, it was the temple. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east. The waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward and behold there ran out waters on the right side. So basically in Ezekiel 47 as we get started we've got the temple and then from out of the temple heading east toward the Jordan River was this water that was flowing out of the temple heading east. Now, is that literal or is that symbolic? Is there some message in that that we're going to be learning here today? I, I think we've got to obviously look at this passage and say, well, you know, I never remember in any stories of Moses' temple, Solomon's temple, or Herod's temple, I never remember a time when there was water flowing out underneath the temple. So obviously, we're looking at something symbolic. Okay, next slide, sweetie. Well, what is that water that flows out of the sanctuary? Well, notice this statement. It's from, I believe it's Desire of Ages. We'll see it in the next slide as well. Christ's words were the water of life. Okay, now that's pretty simple. So when you look at the water in Scripture, in many cases, now of course in Revelation 17, when it says the waters which thou sawest represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. Okay? So water has different meanings in Scripture. This says Christ's words were the water of life. 
There in the presence of the assembled multitude, he set himself apart to be smitten that the water of life might flow to the world. Satan thought to destroy the prince of life, but from the smitten rock there flowed living water. As Jesus thus spoke to the people, their hearts thrilled with a strange awe, and many were ready to exclaim with the woman of Samaria, Give me this water that I thirst not. Now, obviously, folk, in this chapter, and this is in John chapter 7, and also with the woman at the well, when Jesus offered her the water of life. Now, obviously, Jesus was not offering her multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples, right? That's an obvious, that's a given. But he was offering her new life that would come through his words. And that was called the water of life. Next slide. Many of those, this is Desire of Ages 454. Many of those who heard Jesus were mourners over disappointed hopes. Many were nourishing a secret grief. Many were seeking to satisfy their restless longing with the things of the world and the praise of men. But when all was gained, they found that they had toiled only to reach a broken cistern from which they could not quench their thirst. Amid the glitter of the joyous scene, they stood dissatisfied and sad. Now those were Seventh-day Adventists in the first century thinking that they could be satisfied with the things of this world. But then Christ gave that earnest cry and said, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. This startled them from their sorrowful meditation. As they listened to the words that followed, their minds kindled with a new hope. The Holy Spirit represented the symbol before them until they saw in it the offer of the priceless gift of salvation. So, folk, the water that went out from the temple in Ezekiel chapter 47 represented the words of God and his desire to reach the inhabitants of the world with the plan of salvation. Now that's what those waters are in Ezekiel 47 that were coming out of the temple. Now, we all have a choice. We all have a choice to make. Because, see, the words of God, that's, that's one option that comes out of the temple. But, see, we can also choose to spread our own messages, can't we? It's totally up to us what we choose to promote. Next slide. Now, what was that flowing truth that came out of the sanctuary that was then to spread throughout the world. Now we've been called to share the truth of the three angels' messages with every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Those messages of life include the fact that righteousness can only come from Christ. The Ten Commandments are still binding on humanity. The health message to restore us to physical health, to soundness of mind, so we can hear God's voice. Another part of those messages is that the apostate Protestant churches today are in a fallen condition. And that the papacy is the Antichrist. Now those are the messages primarily, not exclusively, but those are the messages that we find in Revelation chapter 14. And they're all found in the light of the judgment hour message 
that began in 1844. So those are the messages of life that God has flowing out of the sanctuary to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Now the question we have to ask ourselves is, are these messages flowing today? Are they flowing throughout the world? From how many different places are they flowing today? There's not a whole lot of places, folks. Not a whole lot of places. So obviously, the waters that God designed that would bring life and hope and healing and understanding to the inhabitants of the world have somehow become murky and dirty and mixed up with all kinds of sediment and all kinds of other things so that those messages of God are not flowing the way they should. Next slide. Well, notice Ezekiel 47, 3-6. Notice what happens with the messages that God designs to give throughout the world. Watch this. It says, when the man that had the line in his hand, now that's, of course, the man that we found in Ezekiel 40, which was Christ, it says, the man who had the line in his hand went forth eastward. He measured a thousand cubits. Now that would be from the sanctuary, so he's measuring, heading towards the, uh, the Jordan River. And he brought me through the waters. Okay, the waters were to the ankles. Okay, so the waters, you know, it's, it's real shallow. It, it's just coming up to the about ankle level. So there's, there's the water. Okay, but let's go on. It says again, he measured a thousand cubits and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. So what's happening? The water's rising. It's getting deeper, isn't it? It's getting deeper. Again he measured a thousand and brought me through and the waters were to the loins. So right here in the midsection. So folk, as Ezekiel is watching this vision unfold, the water is rising. Started at the ankles, went to the knees, now it's up to the loins. Afterward, he measured a thousand, measured another thousand cubits, and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said to me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? And he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now what is the point of that in light of the fact that the water represents the messages of heaven? What's that, what's that saying there, folk? It's saying that those who will walk with God in humility and meekness, God is going to use them and the messages will get broader they will go further and further and further till the water is over all the world. Now, you think about in Habakkuk chapter 2, Habakkuk chapter 2, notice what the Bible says. Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk is the Fifth book from the end of the Old Testament. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. Notice what the Bible says. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. How? As the waters cover the sea. Folk, we live in a world today where we say, well, materialism, secularism, humanism, 
uh, you know, hedonism, doing my thing, my way, whenever I want, that somehow that's going to win in this world. And it appears to be winning, doesn't it? It appears to be winning. But the Bible says in Ezekiel 47 and in Habakkuk chapter 2 that the glory of the character of God and the messages of God for this hour of earth's history, folk, they are going to cover this world as the waters cover the sea. Right now we may look and say they're, they're, they're going about as high as ankle level. Well, folk, maybe they are. But Ezekiel said they're not going to stay there. They're going to get to the knees. They're going to get to the loins. And they're going to get so deep and they're going to spread so far that people won't be able to walk in them anymore. They're going to have to swim. They're going to have to swim. So praise God, folk. Praise God that if, if we will walk meekly and humbly before heaven, knowing that it is His work, and we are simply the paper boy, we're simply the farmer called to sow seeds, folk, God will use His faithful children to do a work that is absolutely mighty in this earth. Next slide. The messages of heaven continue to go forward, offering life and power to those who hear the messages. They continue to increase and expand all the time. You remember that small river we saw in the last couple of slides? Well, you know what? It's going to get bigger, folks. It's going to get wider. It's going to get stronger. It's going to get deeper. Because that is the way of heaven's messages. They will not be stopped, folks. They will not be stopped. Next slide. Now, from the spirit of prophecy, and this is taken from Acts of the Apostles, I want you to notice this statement. Wonderful, wonderful is the work which the Lord designs to accomplish through His church, that His name may be glorified. A picture of this work is given in Ezekiel's vision of the river of healing. Well, you know what, folk? Based on Ellen White's statement here, we had the correct interpretation of the verses in Ezekiel, didn't we? Because Ellen White says, the work that God designs His church to accomplish that He might be glorified is found in Ezekiel's vision of the river of healing. So we got it right. We got it right. Praise God. These waters issue out toward the east country. Go down into the desert. Go into the sea. They go everywhere, folks. Which being brought forth into the sea, the water shall be healed. It shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat whose leaf shall not fade. Neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat or for food, and the leaf thereof for medicine. So we find here the waters, the messages of God spreading out, and it says there will be healing, there will be enlightenment, there will be food for people to eat, to be nourished, to be chubby Christians. Next slide. Okay, this is from Acts of the Apostles, page 13. Okay, the last part, that was the first part of the quote. From the beginning, God has wrought through His people to bring blessing to the world 
to the ancient Egyptian nation, God made Joseph, and notice the words that Ellen White used there, a fountain of life. So there was water. There were principles of truth that were of a heavenly origin. And through the life of Joseph, it was a blessing to Egypt and all the world. All the world. Through the integrity of Joseph, the life of that whole people was preserved. Through Daniel, God saved the life of all the wise men of Babylon. These deliverances are as object lessons. They illustrate the spiritual blessings offered to the world through connection with the God whom Joseph and Daniel worshipped. Everyone in whose heart Christ abides, everyone who will show forth his love to the world, is a worker together with God for the blessing of humanity. As he receives from the Savior grace to impart to others, from his whole being flows forth the tide of spiritual life. Next slide. Now there's something interesting now that's introduced in Ezekiel's vision that seems completely out of place. So far, what we have seen in Ezekiel's vision is flowing, life-empowering, life-nourishing rivers of water where there's healing, where there's understanding, where lights are flashing and coming on. But now notice this. Ezekiel 47, 11, and 12 introduces something that is completely out of place. But the miry places, where did those miry places come from? They weren't in those free-flowing rivers of life and power and energy. But miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. Ooh, miry places? Marshes? How much grows in miry places? Nothing grows. How about in marshes? How much? Now, we're not talking about marsha in the back, we're talking about marshes. How much grows in a marsh? Nothing. Nothing. They shall be given to salt. By the river upon the bank thereof on this side and on that side shall grow all trees for food whose leaves shall not fade. Neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months. Well, folk, it looks like there's, there's a choice there's a choice that each one of us has to make. We can stand behind and put everything on the side of being a river of life, sending forth the messages of God to the world that will develop trees for food for the healing of nations. Or, we can be a miry place. We can be a marshy place. And we can put all of our energy behind that. So which one are we going to be? Next slide. Let's take a look. A miry marsh. It's lifeless. Things are dying. Deuteronomy 29.23 talked about the lands of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboam, with those very same words. The whole land will be a burning waste of salt and sulfur. Nothing planted, nothing sprouting, no vegetation growing on it. 
It will be like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in fierce anger. Do you remember what the land right there near the Jordan River, do you remember what the Bible referred to it as in Genesis 14 before the fires of Sodom and Gomorrah came down? Do you remember what it was called? The Garden of Eden. That's right, Nellie. The Garden of Eden. Does that sound like the Garden of Eden to you? No. Sure doesn't. But that's what these places became because they decided they were going to serve themselves. They were going to do it their way. And that's what they became. That's what they became. Next slide. Now, we have a choice to make. We really do, folk, because there is all kinds of water that flows today amongst us. Now, not in this church that we have, but among us as a group of people all over the world, as Seventh-day Adventists. So we have to ask ourselves, are we going to promote spiritual formation which emanates from the teachings of Ignatius Loyola? Or will we promote the three angels' messages? This, folk, is a miry marsh. This is life-flowing streams. Will we promote rock music or the rock of ages? Will we promote celebration or solemnity in Christ? Will we promote the new international perversion and other like translations or the King James Bible? Will we promote anything goes, do whatever you want, or are the Ten Commandments still binding? Do we believe salvation comes in sin? Or that victory comes through Christ? Is the Pope today our newfound friend? Or is the Pope and the Roman Catholic system still the Antichrist of Scripture? Folk, the world... The worldly churches and predominantly amongst us as Seventh-day Adventists today, we are promoting this, which is a miry marsh, which has no life in it at all, which will take people to the lake of fire. This over here is a flowing river offering to people life in Jesus Christ. Victory, joy, peace. This is a flowing river. This is a miry marsh. Next slide. The messages we proclaim are either a blessing or a curse. We are either a source of life to the world or a source of death. We're either sharing a counterfeit of the true or we are sharing the truth of God for this time. Heaven will not be held captive by our decision. You know, sometimes we get the idea that because of who we are, that God is dependent upon us and that His work can't get done unless we're a part of it. Well, that's not true. Next slide. If you remember in the story of Esther and Mordecai, Mordecai told Esther, he said, Esther, 
If you don't go in before the king, if you choose not to do that, Esther, well, God is not held captive by your decision. Because God has means and people in reserve who will very easily do the work He is calling them to do. And they will bring deliverance for God's people. Enlargement and deliverance will arise to the Jews. That's a guarantee. God's people will be triumphant. The messages of God will win in this world. That's what Mordecai said. He said, now Esther, it's up to you to decide. Are you going to be part of this? Or are you not going to be a part of it? But he said, Esther, if you make the decision not to be a part, you and your father's house will be destroyed. Self-serving has an end result. And it will be death. But who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. For God has called each one of us for such a time as this. Each one of us has been called at this time to be a flowing river in this world. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we willing to step aside and allow God to use us to be that flowing river? Next slide, sweetie. Acts of the Apostles, pages 14 and 15, it says, But the people of Israel lost sight of their high privileges as God's representatives. They forgot God and failed to fulfill their holy mission. The blessings they received brought no blessing to the world. All their advantages they appropriated for their own glorification. They shut themselves away from the world in order to escape temptation. The restrictions that God had placed upon their association with idolaters as a means of preventing them from conforming to the practices of the heathen, they used to build up a wall of separation. They robbed God of the service He required. They robbed their fellow men of religious guidance and a holy example. Next slide. The Jewish leaders thought themselves too wise to need instruction, too righteous to need salvation, too highly honored to need the honor that comes from Christ. So, did God's plan fail? Has God's plan ever failed? Never. And it never will. Because it says here, the Savior turned from them to entrust to others the privileges they had abused and the work they had slighted. So the ancient Seventh-day Adventist church stated they were too wise to be instructed. They were too good to need Christ. They were too highly honored to need the honor that comes from Christ. So what did Jesus do? The Savior turned from them to entrust to others the privileges they had abused and the work they had slighted. God's glory must be revealed, His word established. Christ's kingdom must be set up in the world. The salvation of God must be made known in the cities of the wilderness. And the disciples were called to do the work that the Jewish leaders had failed to do. I often ask myself the question, why is it, why is it that a little out of the way church in the middle of nowhere 
in Eustis, Florida. Why, why did God open up a door to do the work that we have been privileged to do? Why? Why was a radio program opened up in South Central Africa to reach 126 million plus people? Why? Why, folks? The denomination, there's a Seventh-day Adventist conference in Zambia. There's a conference in Malawi and Zimbabwe and all these other places. Why? Why did a radio program open up? Why did a radio station open up over there? Because... The Seventh-day Adventist leaders in that part of the world, they weren't doing the work. And they're not doing the work. And so it says the Savior turned from them to entrust to others the privileges they had abused and the work they had slighted. God's glory must be revealed. His word established. The salvation of God must be made known in the cities of the wilderness. And folk, God is not held captive. If one group says, no, we will not do this work, does God force anybody? Does God say, no, you have to do it? No, he doesn't. He says, that's fine. If you won't do it, I'll get somebody who will. Because, folk, it says, the salvation of God must be made known in the cities of the wilderness. And so God raised up ignorant men called to do the work that the Adventist leaders had failed to do. Next slide. Desire of Ages, page 36. It says, The message of salvation is communicated to men through human agencies. Angels could do it. But God doesn't want angels to do it. He wants us to do it. The Jews, the Adventists, had sought to make a monopoly of the truth, which is eternal life. They had hoarded the living manna, and it had turned to corruption. Folk, just like what Ezekiel said, it had become a miry marsh. It wasn't helping anybody. Promoting spiritual formation and the Pope is our friend and you're going to be saved in sin? That's not helping anybody, folks. The religion which they tried to shut up to themselves became an offense. They robbed God of His glory, defrauded the world by a counterfeit. They refused to surrender themselves to God for the salvation of the world. They became agents of Satan for its destruction. The people whom God had called to be the pillar and ground of the truth had become representatives of Satan. They were doing the work he desired them to do, taking a course to misrepresent the character of God and cause the world to look upon him as a tyrant. The ordinances which God himself had appointed were made the means of blinding the mind and hardening the heart. God could do no more for man through these channels. The whole system must be swept away. You know, folk, I run into people all over the world who will tell me that it doesn't matter what we do or what we say or what we think, that just because we are a Seventh-day Adventist, that that name and that name only will be my meal ticket into God's kingdom. And folk, it won't be. That name is not going to save anybody 
It's not going to save a soul. Truth, truth always wins. Counterfeits, lies, miry marshes will be swept away. Next slide. Are we reaching out to fellow Adventists or reaching the world? You know, there's a lot of groups out there, independent, self-supporting groups throughout the world that their main goal is reaching Adventists in the denomination. Is that what we're supposed to be doing, folks? If we are, we're playing. That's playing. We are to reach world. Revelation 14, 6, I, it says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them in the Adventist church. Is that what your Bible says? No, it doesn't say that. It says to preach to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That's our field of labor. Is our focus on sharing the truth with those who have had the spirit of prophecy for 40 years or are we reaching out to those in darkness? Is our work to reach Adventists or the world? Folk, Jesus told the disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That is still our mission. That is still our focus. And may God help us to be faithful in sharing life-flowing water to the whole world. Let us pray. Dear Father in Heaven, thank You Thank you for this beautiful picture that you painted for Ezekiel. And thank you that you left it for us today. That we might see the triumphant message of heaven that will begin at the ankles, head to the knees, get to the loins, and then become so broad and so wide that people won't be able to walk in it anymore. They'll have to swim. Father in heaven, I pray that you'd strengthen each one of us. Thank you for the work that we can do. Father, I pray that you would strengthen us to ever spread further and further your messages of truth throughout this world so that Jesus can come. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.